welcome to a little chat about the some frequently asked questions, some basics of becoming a flight attendant. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about commuting and crash pads. So commuting and crash pads are two of the most unique and confusing parts of the flight attendant lifestyle. It's this option to commute to work, to not have to live in the city that you are based in or domiciled in. And um, not having to live there means you commute, but instead of commuting by plane or, I mean, commuting by car or train, you do commute by plane as a flight attendant, or you have the option to do that. Um, and when you commute, you usually end up staying in some Thing called a crash pad. So we are going to talk about what commuting is, what it looks like, um, logistics of how it actually works, and then we're going to talk about what a crash pad is, some terminology you may hear surrounding crash pads, hot beds, cold beds, things like that, commuter, reserve, crash pads, things like that. So we're going to talk about that today in this live. Um, I am Abby Unger, the owner and founder of Flight Attendant Career Connection, which is a company that helps aspiring flight attendants land their dream job faster and with less frustration. Um, before we dive in, if you haven't yet uh, signed up for the email list, I send out an email. It's a it's a weekly newsletter that goes out most weeks. Okay, so a little grace. But um, if you haven't signed up yet, if you would check the description of this um, of this video, I'm going to put a link in there so that you can sign up uh, for the newsletter. This is where I send out tips, things that are happening that are kind of top of mind, questions, as well as whenever um, a bigger airline that doesn't accept applications very often, they usually will announce a few days beforehand that they're going to be accepting applications. JetBlue does this, Southwest, Alaska usually does this. Um, I try to send an email out to the list so that, um, you know, it gets posted on social media, but also so that you can get it in your inbox. So please sign up. Um, also, we are having a free group coaching um, experience session on Saturday, July 15th. If you're watching the replay after this, I apologize. The replay is probably going to be available though. So check the description, see if you can find it. But if you're watching this before, for July 15th. Uh, if you're watching it live, today's Tuesday. Um, I would love for you to register for that uh, study hall. It's not going to be here on Facebook. It's going to be on Zoom, which gives us just a lot more functionality to interact with and things like that. So you do have to register, but it's free. Again, I'm going to put the link in the description. Okay, enough housekeeping. Let's talk about commuting and crash pads. So like I said, one of the most unique things about the flight attendant lifestyle, which becoming a flight attendant really is a lifestyle, embracing a lifestyle more than just a job or even a career. It really is a lifestyle. And one of the things that lends itself to being a lifestyle over just a job is this ability to live anywhere. Technically. Now, whether or not you decide to live anywhere or if you decide to move to the city that you're based in is going to be your choice uh, depending on your circumstances, your options. But this is something that a lot of flight attendants and pilots do. They commute. They commute by plane. So what does that look like? Well, you probably know that one of the benefits of being a flight attendant, one of the company benefits, health insurance, 401k, things like that, you also get to fly for free. So what that means is you get to fly for free if there's an open seat. And you usually get to fly for free on your airline if there's an open seat, but your airline will also have agreements with most of the other airlines. Pretty much every airline has a reciprocal agreement with all the other airlines that will allow flight attendants to ride in an open cabin seat, not a jump seat, but an open cabin passenger seat uh, for free. So it basically helps out the airlines. It's a way of um, allowing the industry to continue to operate smoothly. So if I owned an airline and you owned an airline and we both had flight attendants that were commuting and we got together and said, hey, I'll let your flight attendants ride in my open seats if you let my flight attendants ride in your open seats and that way everyone can get to work. And you say, what do you say? Bet. Is that the right thing? You say bet. <laughs> you say yes. That sounds great. Um, trying to get my Gen Z, uh, you know, slang in there. Uh, so if in, and so that is called an open cabin um, agreement. And it's a reciprocal, meaning 
I'm reciprocating that to you back and forth. So it's a reciprocal open cabin agreement. Uh, sometimes this is called a jump seat agreement. That's an old terminology left over from when we actually could ride in each other's jump seats, but we can't do that anymore. But you'll sometimes hear like, oh yeah, we have a jump seat agreement with them. That doesn't mean you can ride in their jump seat, but it means that you can fly on them without having to pay the small fee that your family members would have to pay um, if they were to purchase a standby ticket on another airline. Okay, so that is, that's one thing to kind of know about that I think sometimes people don't always know is that you will have the ability to commute on pretty much any airline. So of course you'll need to research your airline and speak with your airline, um, the union, as well as your leadership and read your documentation to find out exactly if there's any exceptions to that or if there's a time limit um, that you have to, or if there's a certain amount of time you have to work uh, before you get your full benefits, okay? So that's something that though that I think is really, um, it should be encouraging. So this means when you're looking at your hometown airline or airport and you're trying to decide if you're going to commute or not, you don't have to only look at the airline that you're going to be working for. If I'm going to work, uh, if I get hired by American and I'm based in LA, I don't have to only look at the American Airlines flights that fly to LA. I could also look at the Southwest flights that go to LA from my city, uh, the Delta flights, the Allegiant flights, the Spirit flights, the Alaska flights, all of those different um, airlines, I would have the option to fly on if there's an open seat right? So commuting on your own airline is usually preferable because you have um, a little bit easier, you have more access to information, you can see how many open seats there are, whereas you can't always see that on other airlines, and your priority as to um, if there's not enough seats, as to who gets those open seats on your own airline is going to be higher, you're going to have a better chance. So, but that's just something to think about, um, hopefully kind of encouraging. Now, what does commuting mean? Commuting means, like I said at the beginning, instead of going to work in a car or train or subway or bicycle, you go by plane. So you fly on um, an airplane to get to work. You commute. You don't live in the city that you're based in. There's lots of different reasons why people choose to commute. Uh, one reason would be their family is established in the city that they're currently living in, and it would be a lot to relocate to a new city. So their husband has a job, their kids are in school, uh, maybe their support system is there to help take care of their children, uh, their sister, their mom, grandma, whoever that's gonna be taking helping to care for children is also there. Maybe they own a house, maybe this is just their hometown and this is where their roots run deep and they're not ready to move uh, to another place. These are reasons and very reasonable reasons to commute. Um, this is usually what happens with new flight attendants. This is why a new flight attendant would commute. But sometimes um, it's, it happens the other way around. Uh, once you've been a flight attendant for a while, maybe you move to your base, maybe you move to Chicago and you decide and you've been a flight attendant for a while and you decide that you wanna buy something, you want to settle down, you wanna purchase a piece of property. Uh, maybe uh, the prices in Chicago are out of reach for you and so you decide to move to another city. Uh, when I was at United, my first trip that I worked, I worked with a flight attendant who had been with United for a really long time, I think 22 years or so, and this was 2006, um, and she actually was had been based in Chicago for a long time, but about seven years before I met her, she had decided to move to Charlotte so that she could buy a condo. So she commutes from Charlotte. She has enough seniority to kind of own her own schedule, and Charlotte was affordable to her and she was ready to kind of to go ahead and buy a piece of property. So that's another reason that flight attendants commute. It's not always just new flight attendants that have that aren't able to move. Some people really do make this choice you know, later to cut to start commuting again. Um, some people will move temporarily when they first get hired because they are um, because of the price, uh, the pay <laughs> because of the pay rate rate, they're going to kind of stay settled where they are and not incur that extra expense of moving right away. And then once they get off reserve and they hold a line, so but once they get off call and they kind of know what their schedule is going to look like every month, and they have more control over it, then they 
they will maybe start commuting um, again. So sometimes they'll move at the beginning. Sometimes they'll stay put at the beginning. So that's a little bit about how people make different decisions about commuting. Now, um, every airline, <clears throat> ha not every, I think every airline has, most airlines have what's called a commuter policy. This is another term that you're going to hear floating around, commuter policy. So um, you will find the commuter policy for the airline that you're researching in their contract, in their collective bargaining agreement. So um, every airline in the U.S., pretty sure every airline, correct me if I'm wrong, every airline in the U.S. except for SkyWest and Delta um, are part of a union, which means they have a contract uh, that is decided on every several years uh, that basically has the rules that each side is going to play by, the flight attendant and the company. In that contract is usually a commuter clause. Now, commuter clause is, um, not every airline has them, most of them do. It's basically, if I'm a commuter, if, if I'm having trouble getting to work, if I do these certain steps, then I can prevent getting in trouble for that. So Southwest, you, you may hear, has the best commuter policy, which is true. So they have the best commuter policy. Their commuter policy, this is in their contract. Please read it to verify. Don't just trust the girl on the internet. But you can find it on the internet. You can find the contract <laughs> and read it yourself. But their commuter policy, as I understand it, is you have to list for one Southwest flight or two other airline flights that will get you to work in time. So if I'm commuting and I list for my one Southwest flight and it's full or it cancels or it's super delayed by weather, then I wouldn't make it to work in time to work the flight that I'm assigned. And if that's the case and I have satisfied the commuter policy, then I um, will not get in trouble. Um, you're also, though, not pay protected in most cases, as I understand it. So I wouldn't be paid for the flight I was supposed to work, but I wouldn't get in trouble. Some airlines have uh, different uh, things you have to satisfy, how soon you have to try to get to work. Some airlines only let you use this commuter clause a certain amount of times a year. Again, it's all in the contract. If you want to find the airline's contract that you're researching, if you go to the internet and you type in the name of the airline and then flight attendant and then collective bargaining agreement. So Southwest Airlines flight attendant collective bargaining agreement. And that should bring up the contract. They're on the internet, okay? They're not super private. They're, I think they're probably a public document, I would think, because the government's pretty heavily involved in uh, contracts and union, protecting unions and things like that. So um, that's how you can find out about this commuter clause, all right? So that is another term that we hear a lot about is commuter clause. When you first start as a flight attendant, you will be on reserve unless you are with an airline that is growing so quickly that you hold a line or get a set schedule uh, within a few months, or if you work for Delta, because Delta um, actually shares their reserve in a different way, and I'll go over that in a minute. But for the most part, odds are you're gonna be on reserve when you get started. And that means that you are gonna be on call, required to be in your base within a certain distance, amount of time from the airport. It's usually two hours. Sometimes it's three or four hours, depending on the, the city layout that you're in. So let's use two hours. So if I'm on reserve, I'm required to be in base within two hours of my airport that I am based at or domiciled at when my reserve period starts. So if I'm working for an airline that has 24 hour reserve that means monday i start reserve monday at midnight that means i have to be in base by 10 o'clock the night before or by midnight i guess technically that night so monday i can't fly in on monday i can't say oh i'm on call let me fly in on monday i actually have to get to my base city on Sunday, Sunday evening. So I have to look at the flights. I have to figure out which flights have room. Um, and then I'm going to fly into my city. And I'm when I'm in my city, my base city, I'm responsible for my housing. So when I'm working a trip, once I get sent out on a trip, the airline will take care of my transportation to and from the hotel, as well as my hotel accommodations. But when I'm on reserve, and I am responsible for my own housing in my base. So if I'm on reserve for, let's say, three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then that means I need to be in base 
on Sunday. Okay, Sunday is my day off, but I'm responsible for going to the airport. And depending on the routing, I might be leaving around noon. I might leave around noon on my day off. Uh, so I've lost kind of half a day off to go and go to my crash pad or go to wherever I'm staying in my base city. And then I wait to be called. Now, if I get a call first thing on Monday for a three day trip, I'm off and I'm off and running. I'm headed to the airport. I'm staying in the hotel. The, ho the air airlines got me in my hotel those next two nights. And then the end of my trip comes. Let's see, we were on a three day trip, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So Wednesday, my trip ends. Now, depending on what time I get back on Wednesday, I might be able to go ahead and fly home because Thursday's my day off. So if I get in about five o'clock and I call crew scheduling and they release me because I've already worked all day, I don't have a lot of time left on my um for my uh for my work day that i would be available to them then they could release me and i could go and get on a 6 30 flight or a seven o'clock flight or the nine o'clock flight or the 11 o'clock flight or whatever flight is leaving that evening and go home if that happens i kind of get a bonus night at home but a lot of times on reserve i'm gonna get back and it's gonna be after that last flight left so I'm getting in at nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and my last commuter flight, my last flight that would get me home has already left as well. So on Wednesday, I'm finished. I call crew scheduling. They release me to days off. I don't get to go home right then. I need to go back to my crash pad for the evening, and then Thursday morning, I can wake up bright and early and catch that first flight home. Now that's a day off as well that I'm commuting on. So depending on the routing and the loads, let's say I don't get home till noon, again, half my day off is now gone. Um, if I only had that one day off, if I only had one day off, depending on how the schedule goes, it probably wouldn't even be worth it for me to go home, right? Because remember, I had to leave my house on Sunday at noon, and if I'm not getting into my house until noon on um, Thursday, then it would just be time to turn around and head back. So I would maybe not even go home on that day off because, in fact, I probably wouldn't, because it wouldn't be worth it for me to try to go commute and get back. Because remember, I'm responsible for getting back as well. Um, so I'd probably just kind of stay put. So that's how commuting looks. Now, once I, that's when I'm on reserve. Now, once I hold a line, which means is our term for knowing what my schedule looks like. Once I'm no longer on call every day and I'm holding a line, I will be able, I will have more control over my schedule. And hopefully I will get to the point where I have what's called a commutable line, okay? And this is this is sort of like um, a slang. It, it's not like it would be published as a commutable line from the company's point of view because everybody has different times that their flights would leave their city. But for me, I would be looking for, once I'm holding a line, I'm going to be looking for flights that check in in the afternoon on day one and finish up in the morning or early afternoon on the last day or trips that have one of those are even helpful, right? So if I'm starting in the afternoon on day one, that means I get to spend my whole day off at home. And then on Monday, I could commute in at noon to work a flight, a trip that starts at three. So now I've gotten my whole Sunday back. And maybe that trip doesn't still doesn't get in on Wednesday until nine or 10. So I do need to spend one night in a crash pad, but I've reduced the number of nights I have had to stay. And that, and then eventually I'll be able Able to uh, manipulate my schedule to the point that my trips check in late enough and check out early enough that I am never staying in my city unless there's irregular operations or which means weather or, or mechanical or something goes awry. And then I may need to stay in my city, in my base city. But for the most part, my trips are going to allow me to just fly in the morning of and fly out the evening of without having to um, have a full time kind of accommodations in that city. All right. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you about reserve that I forgot to mention. Now, I gave you a scenario where I got a trip. But let's say that I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm on reserve. So I commute in on Sunday. I'm in my crash pad. Monday, I sit all day and I never get called. I don't get a trip. So Monday night, I'm in my crash pad. Tuesday, I wake up. I sit all day. I never get a trip. Tuesday night, I'm in my crash pad. Wednesday, I sit all day. I'm in my crash pad. Don't get a trip. Wednesday, since 
everything's been going pretty good. There's a good chance crew scheduling would possibly release me in time to catch that last flight home on Wednesday, especially since I haven't been used in three days. But that's not a guarantee. Um, what I'm going to plan on is staying that Wednesday night in the hotel or in my crash pad. Uh, because I didn't get a trip. So there is the chance that as a commuter, instead of sitting at on reserve at home, I'm sitting in a crash pad. Now, um, you know, when you talk to people who've been around a long time, senior mamas, senior papas, they're going to be, they're going to say things like, but y'all are so lucky because you have cell phones. We used to have pagers or landlines. Yeah. And in back in the day, it was, you had to call crew scheduling and say, hey, I'm getting ready to hop in the shower because you can't take your landline into the bathroom with you. And so you'd need to be released for 15 minutes to take a shower or, and then it got better and everyone had pagers. So then you could at least go out and crew scheduling would pay you and then you only had like seven minutes to call find a pay phone what it call them back so now you have your cell phone so on those days those three days i'm either exploring my new city or i'm going to the mall or i'm at least sitting at the coffee shop when i was on reserve in houston i would go to the movies a lot uh because it's just a nice way to kind of distract uh, i like to go into the movies there's lots of different things that you can do while you're sitting on reserve but as you can imagine Sitting at home, if you li if you're based where you live, sitting at your house and just like piddling around and doing your laundry and hanging out and maybe even meeting with friends or having lunch or something is better than just sitting in your crash pad. So that's something to kind of think about. All right. So that is um, a lot about commuting. Now I want to talk for a few minutes about what is a crash pad. And of course, if you have any questions about commuting, you can put them in the comments. Um, I'll do my best to try to make another video that maybe goes more in depth. Uh, but what, uh, let's talk about crash pads. So crash pad is a general term. When you hear someone say my crash pad or I'll need to get a crash pad or do I have to get a crash pad or I'm going to stay in my crash pad. Crash pad is a very generic and general and broad term for the place that you stay when you are um, in base. So if you don't live in base, the place you stay when you are commuting into your base is your crash pad. OK, so it's it's different. It, it could have different terminologies. So the first thing I want to talk about is like a traditional crash pad. This is what most people think about when you say a crash pad. So in big cities, New York, uh, San Francisco, uh, Dallas, uh, Chicago, L.A., um, D.C., Dallas, there are uh, people who will usually in the industry who will either take a house or an apartment and convert it into a crash pad. And what that means is they'll put a bunch of bunk beds in it, okay? So, and they're kind of run like a little business. Um, sometimes it's just enough to help cover all the rent. Sometimes it is an actual business where they are making a little bit of income providing you this service of allowing you to have a nice safe place to stay. Um, so when I was based in Newark, I stayed in what you would consider like a traditional crash pad. So the lady who ran it, um, she used to be a customer service agent for United and her and her husband now had bought a house near the airport and this was their business and they ran a crash pad. So there was, I think, 32 beds total in this house. It was a big house. I was in the attic. There were like 10 of us in the attic. Um, we all had our own bed, like a Ikea twin and we all had a little foot locker little um thing you know like a chest of drawers small and she would do the laundry you know when we left we would strip the bed she would do the laundry she would do the towels clean the house she also run the shut ran the shuttle so we would text her when we needed to be picked up so all of that was included and that's why it can be really run as a business because there is a lot of work and amenities that she was providing to us um, and so that was, that was a great experience. That was a crash pad. Now, some crash pads are not all great experiences. Um, some of them are dirtier than others. Some of them are, um, louder than others, more of a party than others, quieter than others. There's just all different kinds of crash pads. Um, now that we have social media and you can connect with people that you work with and get referrals, uh, that is so valuable. The thing I do want to say about setting up a crash pad or like joint, not setting up, but, um, staying in a crash pad or buying or renting into a crash pad is 
never send anyone any money before you see it. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of scams that are going around even with crash pads um, about trying to like, I won't even like look at you or consider you until you pay me $250. You know, that's unless it's something like you really, really know the person or it's been a very legit referral, I would not respond to just an ad and then and then give money, okay? So you do wanna see the place before or at least kind of interact with the person in real life uh, before you give money. Um, and that's kind of like a general <clears throat> piece of advice to kind of help keep you safe. Of course, every situation is different. You know, if you're flying with someone and they're like, oh, I, I have a crash pad, I have room, I'd love to have you. And like y'all spent four days together and you're like, you know, done. That that's fine. I'm not saying like never, ever don't be like, well, Abby told me, you know, you can trust your gut. But in general, don't respond to just an, an ad like a cold ad and then start sending money to people. And that's pretty much in any situation. Right. OK, so that's a traditional crash pad. Now, there's other things that people use as a crash pad and you may decide to do one of these options instead if staying in you know, what's kind of like a hostel or um, it's, it's even more than a dorm. It's more people than a dorm, um, a traditional crash pad. There's other options. So sometimes people will rent an apartment with one or two of their classmates. So they graduate from training. You're all based together. You could rent a one bedroom apartment and get uh, some cheap beds. And now you've sort of created your own crash pad. Now you're not running it as a business. It's you and two of your friends slash coworkers that are staying there and splitting the rent to cut down on on the number of people and to cut down on the expense. I would call that my crash pad. In fact, I did that in Houston. I rented a one bedroom apartment with one of my classmates. We call I would call it a crash pad because I wasn't actually living there. Um, I was just crashing there. Uh, another option could be to uh, rent a room from one of your classmates. One of my classmates um, in training did this um, in Houston. She went ahead and rented a, the spare room from one of our other classmates who lived in Houston. So she rented that room, again, an affordable way to have a place to crash when you're in base without having to fully relocate. Um, I, When I was based in Charlotte, I rented a room in a condo from a lady that, uh, another one of my coworkers, she was renting the whole condo. And there were a couple of us who kind of rented the two spare bedrooms. There was maybe like three of us total. And we would just sort of uh, stay there when we needed to. Um, that was my crash pad in Charlotte. So there are different options. Um, there's a company called Hotel Crash Pad Network, and they're actually a sponsor of Flight Attendant Career Connection. But Hotel Crash Pad Network, Ho Hotel Crash Pad Network is a phenomenal resource. Now, they're not in every city, but they're growing. But what they do, it's owned by a pilot at JetBlue. And what he does is he partners with a hotel in one of the cities and they take all the furniture out of the hotel room and put bunk beds in it. So they turn it into a crash pad, but they're at really nice hotels, Hilton's, Marriott's, which means you have access to the uh, amenities that are there, like the beautiful lobby, the pool, housekeeping. If there's a breakfast, you get the breakfast, um, the shuttle, all of that you're because you're staying as a guest in that hotel but you're in the crash pad room um and that's hotel crash pad network so look them up especially this is a this is a company that i trust that does a really good job of um of sourcing really nice places to stay now this is a great option. Like if I was going back to flying right now and I was being based in a city that Hotel Crash Pad Network was at, I would, to help just relieve the stress of the whole thing, I would go ahead and sign up with them and stay in one of their crash pads for at least a few months. And then I could maybe get net uh, network or get connections if I wanted to do something that wasn't as much of a traditional crash pad. But that gives me a little bit of a runway straight out of training to get settled in a place that I know is good. And then if I wanted to say like, hey, who has a room for rent or whatever, or maybe um, maybe I love it and it's fine and I just stay there. Right. But I think that that's a really good way. So if you're stressing about how am I going to find a crash pad? Please check out Hotel Crash Pad Network first. Um, they're not always the cheapest that you can find in the city. But again, the amenities and the way that it's it's run well is valuable, especially if this is your first 
your, you know, your, your first couple months in a city. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit about crash pads. Now, one more thing about crash pads, uh, terminology wise. Um, well, let's talk about basics. One is usually pay by the month. Some have like a drop in fee that you can do per night, but usually you're going to pay by the month. It's going to be anywhere from $200 to $450, depending on the crash pad, depending on private room, depending on the city, all of that. But just so that you sort of, I like numbers. I like a range, you know, how much is it maybe? <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so that's kind of what you can be thinking. And let's talk about hot bugs and cold bugs. I love to tell this. I don't know why. I just think this is so cool. So you'll hear terms like hot bunk or cold bunk. So you can either rent a hot bunk or you can rent a cold bunk. Some crash pads are all hot bunks. Some crash pads are all cold bunks. Okay. So hot bunk and cold bunk. What that means is it means whether or not you have your own bed that is always yours. Not like you're sleeping alone in the bed. You're sleeping alone in the bed, but it's like whether or not you are always in the same bed. So technically a hotel, every hotel in the world is hot bunks because every time you go to a hotel, you're not the only one that ever sleeps in that bed, right? Someone slept in there the night before and someone will sleep there the night after. So technically every hotel in the world is a hot bunk. Um, and so what happens, the same concept. I feel like when I start to say you don't, you know, someone else could sleep in your bed, we start to get the icks. So that's why I like to remind everyone, every hotel is like that. Um, now your bed at home, though, is probably a cold bed because someone's not just, you know, you're always, you're not just sleeping in a different bed in your house. <laughs> you know, it's not like the people who you live with, just everyone just picks a bed every night, right? It's a cold bed. It's like, this is my bed in my bedroom. This is where I sleep. Okay. So that's kind of the difference. The term is actually an old military term from the submarines. So when they first started, the Navy first started using submarines, they had um, half as many bunks as they had men. So if they had a hundred men on board, they would only put 50 bunks on board to save space and everything. And so the day shift, people working during the day would sleep at night. And then when they got up, the night shift was just getting off work and they would be going to bed. So when they got in the bed, someone else had just been sleeping in it and it would still be warm. So that's why it's called a hot bunk because the bunk is warm from the last person. That's where the term comes from. Now you're not gonna ever slide into a bed that is still warm, I don't think, from the previous person because crash pads still keep the sanitation up. So either you will have your own um, your own linens that you bring with you or that you keep there, or you would strip the bed afterwards and the crash pad would provide the fresh linens for the next person. So you're not sleeping in used sheets like a hotel, right? So the sheets are being changed, but someone may, you wouldn't always get like the bottom right bunk. Sometimes you might be over here in this bunk. Sometimes you might be in the top bunk. Um, and that's if it's a hot bunk. If it's a cold bunk or a cold bed, then you will always be in that bed. In my crash pad in Newark, we had cold beds. So I knew which twin bed up in the attic was mine. Um, it looked like Madeline, you know, the little orphan in France. It looked just like her orphanage. So these little beds uh, down both sides. Um, really sweet. So <laughs> I had my same bed, though, every time. And um, like I said, the lady who ran it did the linens and things like that. But I wasn't wondering which bunk I would be in, which is helpful it, when you come in late at night and things like that. You don't have to figure out like which bunk is open. Um, so that's the difference between hot bunks and cold bunks. Um, and I think that that is all the information I wanted to share. We're right at about the 30 minute mark. So this is when I was hoping to wrap up. Um, I don't want to just, I could talk forever, but I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. Um, so there's going to be, uh, if you're watching the replay, I'm doing five of these videos um, every day um, and, or no, one every day for five days. So five of these videos. And again, if you're not on the email list, please check the link in the description so that you can get on the email list so you don't miss anything um, and uh, sign up for the free study hall that's on uh, July. 15th. I'm so excited. We've got a couple hundred people already signed up. So it's going to be really, really a uh, great opportunity to hear from different people's experiences and things like that. So I'm looking forward to connecting with you uh, throughout the week and on Saturday. Have a great day.